Welcome to Lyme Time. I'm Allie from the Tick Chicks. We are all more than Lyme disease and chronic illness, and together we stand with you to overcome and rise. I'll bring you closer to the experts in cutting edge treatments and even a few unexpected ways of healing. I'll ask the questions you want answers to regarding Lyme disease and successful ways of getting you closer to 100%. We are in this together and will not be defined by Lyme. Ross Douthit joined the New York Times as an opinion columnist in April 2009. Previously, he was a senior editor at The Atlantic. He is the author of The Deep Places, a memoir of illness and discovery, which was published in October 2021, as well as four previous books, most recently, The Decadent Society, How We Became the Victims of Our Own Success, released in 2020. He is the film critic for National Review, and he lives with his wife and four children in New Haven. So I'd like to welcome you, Ross. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Well, I have to say, you know, you've been sort of a modern day pioneer in terms of Lyme disease and spreading its awareness through the New York Times columns. I mean, that's how I found out about you. And... I think recently I heard about them through um, your your series, and that was around the time of your book release in October 2021. They kind of went viral in the Lyme world, um, as I'm sure you know, and so I'm very honored to have you here with with me. And having just read your memoir, I'm I'm deeply appreciative of of everything you do for Lyme disease. The book, uh, in my opinion, is full of insight, relatability, I mean, I think would be my number one um, factor in this book. Every single thing you said was me. And I think probably to every warrior out there that's ever battled Lyme disease, um, you you give a precise definition of all your symptoms. Um, just It's just very inspirational and very honest for sure. So being a New York Times columnist, I imagine you have completed more research on Lyme disease and chronic Lyme disease than, and tick-borne illness for that matter, perhaps more than anyone else. So my listeners today will be paying attention and every word you say will be a new revelation for so many people out there. Can you tell us a bit about your own Lyme disease journey? Sure, and and thank you so much for the kind words. I don't know if I've really done more research than anybody, but maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe more than anybody who is currently employed by the New York Times. Although I will say that there are, I'm not the only person in a major American newspaper who has who has had Lyme disease. Um, <clears throat> I've just maybe been the most embarrassingly naked in exposing. <laughs> exposing the experience. Um, but yeah, I got I got sick um, in 2015. And the backstory is that uh, my wife and I were living in Washington, DC at the time. Uh, we then had only two kids, not, not yet four. Uh, and we were both from Connecticut originally. Uh, I was from New Haven. My wife was from the western part of the state, closer to New York City. And we'd always had this sort of fantasy of of the rural life right you know get escaping the city getting out in nature you know um and and at a certain point because i had a, a job at the times it was kind of a dream job i could live basically anywhere as long as i could get to new york city and washington periodically um and you know, we would sort of look at houses in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., and we didn't really want to live there. Our families were in the Northeast. Um, we decided to basically make this fantasy a reality. And we sold our little row house in Capitol Hill um, for more money than we anticipated. So we were flush. <laughs> everything was everything was going our way. Uh, and we just took that money and plowed it into a house built in 1790, a, you know, literally the cliche of the Connecticut countryside, stone walls, a horse pasture, a barn, um, all of these things. And, and that was, you know, we had this vision of our children running through those fields and, you know, whatever, whatever fantasies you can imagine for 
for New England living. We had them. Um, <clears throat> but we had this period over the summer where we had bought the house, but we had a rent back agreement with our our house in DC and we were staying in DC to wrap some things up uh, and do a little work from a distance on on the farmhouse. And during that time I got sick uh, and it started um, a, a little bit after we did the home inspection, in fact, on the property we were buying. I think that's the most likely scenario for when I actually encountered a tick. Um, and I, it started with a little red swelling on my neck. I never saw the tick. I didn't get a bullseye rash. Um, and, you know, basically it sort of slowly and then rapidly escalated from there to neck pain, headaches, jaw pain, and then these sort of full body meltdowns where I, you know, felt sort of weird vibrations all over my body. I, you know, felt like I was having, fa I mean, phantom heart attacks, but what felt reasonably like heart attacks, crushing pain across my chest, um, you know, diarrhea. I couldn't eat for a long time. Uh, for weeks and weeks, I lost about 40 pounds in, in six weeks and I couldn't sleep. I was sleeping about an hour a night. And again, we were still in Washington and uh, I saw doctor after doctor after doctor. You know, we were moving, we were buying a new house. My wife, uh, we found out she was pregnant with our third child around then. I couldn't be sick. I absolutely couldn't be sick. So I just, you know, went went from doctor to doctor, specialist to specialist, uh, and none of them had any idea what was wrong with me. And, you know, the main message was you have a lot going on in your life. You're under a lot of stress. This is probably sort of some kind of anxiety mediated issue. Um, and, you know, by the end of the summer, by the time we moved to DC, I was, you know, taking sleeping pills on Xanax, uh, Xanax, I went to, you know, went to see a psychiatrist. Um, and I was, you know, perfectly open. <laughs> I was open to any diagnosis, right? If, yeah, if, sure. if seeing as if, if talking about, you know, my issues with my parents was going to help me feel better, I would talk about my issues with my parents. Um, but then it was, so that was sort of the period of mystery, uh, which compared to some other people with Lyme was actually mercifully short because once we got to Connecticut and I sort of switched uh, both to regular doctors in the area, and, but even to the psychiatrist who I saw when we, when we first moved, everyone basically said, well, you know, we see a lot of weird cases like this. Um, you have not, you're not testing positive for Lyme disease, but we think you should try an antibiotic uh, just to see what happens. Um, and I took, I started taking an antibiotic in serious doses and very quickly sort of stabilized. Uh, my, I stopped deteriorating. I was able to eat. I went from an hour of sleep a night to five hours, maybe. Um, and all of that, uh, you know, basically made it pretty clear that I probably had Lyme or some kind of, some kind of tick-borne illness. Um, but then for me, the challenge was getting from that stability to actual recovery, uh, because I took the antibiotics and if I went off them, I immediately felt much worse. Uh, but I didn't improve beyond that stabilization. I still had terrible pain, sort of cycling and cycling all around my body. Um, I, you know, I was, yeah, I was still in, I, I could survive, but I was still in really bad shape. And so then the next few years really were this sort of, Quest that again, many of your listeners are very familiar with um, through multiple different doctors, a lot of different treatments, many of them sort of the conventional treatments for chronic Lyme, strong doses of antibiotics, multiple doses, multiple kinds of antibiotics, and also a lot of um, the weirder things that people with these conditions try. Um, and at a certain point, I, I found, you know, a set of things that seemed to work for me after you know 18 months or two years. And then I started to improve uh, and I've continued to improve to this day. It's been seven years now. Uh, and I usually say I'm 90 to 95% better, which means I still have weird mild pain around my body. And when I get you know one of the many colds that our kids bring home, I get old symptoms back. Anything that sort of weakens it seems to weaken my immune system or weaken me physically can sort of resurface things. Um, 
but I've, yeah, I've made, I've made a lot of progress and I wouldn't have written the book if I hadn't made progress. It was important to me to be able to say, especially because this is such a controversial illness that not just that I was really and truly sick, but that, you know, the kinds of things that people try that are sort of outside of the medical mainstream can really, can really work. Um, but so the book, the book covers most of that story uh, and also tries to sort of get into, you know, it's sort of a Stephen King side to the story, as I say a few times, right? You're, uh -huh. you know, you're, you're trapped with your wife and your kids in this <laughs> rural isolation. Your wife's not sure whether you're sane or not. You're a writer, it's sort of like Jack Nicholson in The Shining. Um, and there really is, you know, this sort of weird fairy tale, dark fairy tale-ish element to the whole tick-borne illness phenomenon. It's, you know, this thing that lurks in the woods that, you know, sort of steals your life away or sort of imprisons you in your body. That was how I felt most of the time, like that myself was still there, but my body had sort of turned against itself. Um, it's a great so, depiction of it, you know, your yeah. mind just slowly deteriorating, not because it mostly because you you feel largely misunderstood, I would say. And that's the worst part about it is nobody, nobody can relate to what you're saying. And you are certainly, uh, I mean, I don't blessed, I should say with the fact that you were in Connecticut and you did have doctors that sort of could recognize the signs and symptoms. I went in LA six years without anybody knowing what was going on. And that was why I started this entire thing because it out here, it's just not the same. They would never hand you out here just antibiotics without getting your test results back, for instance, which they do commonly on the East Coast. So there's a little bit of a lag time for us over here on the East or on the West Coast. And I do like, I do like about your book that you go through it in a chronological order in terms of every, and I do think that you tried possibly everything known to man out there. You tried every course of antibiotics and every possible way you could tr try them. Um, and then you even have a chapter on your, what you coin your weirder um, <laughs> treatments. Um, yep. And, and yet, you know, sort of at the end of the day, it's, it's all necessary. It's it it requires an army attack mentality of attacking from all different sides as aggressively as you can. And I think that's pretty much what you did. Um, how were your columns on chronic Lyme disease perceived, you know, by your colleagues or by readers of the New York Times? I mean, I think it's a tiny bit hard to say for me to say for sure. Uh, in a way, you know, I mean, there was a certain amount of basic favorability and sympathy, right? You're writing, you know, the columns sort of tried to, they didn't, you know, cover all of the ground that the book covers, but they tried to give a sense of sort of how I got sick, what it's, you know, what it's like to have a medically contested disease. Uh, and then, as you mentioned, some of the weirder things that I, that I tried to give sort of a sense of what it's like to live, to live on the fringe. Um, so there was sort of a basic, a basic sympathy. Um, in a way, there was less sort of overtly skeptical responses than than I expected. I got, you know, sort of letters to the editor from some of the doctors who think chronic Lyme disease is fake saying, well, you know, Mr. Douth had obviously suffered a lot, but um, lots of people get better from mysterious things for mysterious reasons. And he can't prove that it was the antibiotics that did it right So, you know, that that was sort of expected. Um, but I think I think there's, uh, you know, there's a my my sense was that there were a lot of people who were not convinced that I really had Lyme disease, but respected me on other grounds and sort of were like, OK, well, you know, Ross has been through a lot. We're going to give him the benefit of the doubt. Right. Um, and, you know, to some extent, those are the people you're trying to convince. So. In a way, I appreciated the people who were more overt. You know, there were a few reviews that were like, this is a beautifully written book, but I don't believe in chronic Lyme for an instant, you know, right? And I, I sort of appreciated those reviews more than the sort of like, you know, 
Well, uh, it's interesting, Ross. Uh, let's go back to talking about politics, kind of, exactly. kind, of res- kind of responses. But it's you know it's a hard thing, right? Because you're trying to do several things simultaneously in a book like this. You're trying to be convincing and persuasive, right? So the book, you know, offers sort of a basic account of what the scientific theories behind chronic Lyme are, you know, why I think the medical evidence at this point is quite strong that chronic tick-borne illness is real and should be treated in this sort of, you know, what you're calling this, you know, the sort of everything, (laughs) you know, throw everything at it way. So you're trying to marshal that evidence, but then as a writer, you're also trying to be true to the reality of the experience and the reality of the experience is messy and uncertain and you yourself go through periods of doubt is this really what's wrong with me you know is it actually all in my head um and also be true to um yeah the weird the weirder experiences that you inevitably inevitably have um i mean to me one thing that's interesting since you're talking about east coast versus west coast right like my sense is that the west sort of the west coast because there are just so many fewer cases of Lyme, the sort of official medical response is definitely poorer than the response on the East Coast. For the weirder stuff, though, the West Coast is all in for <laughs> We got it. it. You know, we got right, it. No, here. I, we got people, you covered. <laughs> I would, you know, I, w- one of the things I write about, right, is the, the Rife machine, which is something that generates sound waves and frequencies that are supposed to shatter, shatter bacteria in your body and do other strange things. And, you know, people on the east coast it's like what what are you what are you talking about right and and but then you have a conversation with someone from LA who says oh yeah man I got one of those after I had a surfing accident and I had headaches and it really helped a lot right so there's you know there there are there's there some give and of, take there's, there's a lot of give and take and some distinctions yeah that are that are just interesting interesting to notice with these things and well even living here in California I never thought I would tap into so many different alternative treatments myself. So it was definitely out of my comfort zone. In fact, I resisted it for many years. And until I couldn't, until I just gave up, (laughs) I was just sort of like, okay, let's go over here for a second, you know, and I did a left turn. And actually, I don't know. I mean, it was it coincidental. You talk about this in your book, how some of the skeptics out there are saying, was it just, you know, is Lyme disease a wait, a wait until, you know, is it just, does it eventually sort of get better? And then you introduced alternative medicines at just the right point, right. you know, to take you over the, over into the healing aspect of your journey, or do they actually work? I mean, is there, is there some merit to, you know, meditation, uh, stress release, um, brain retraining, all, all, all of this stuff that's not conventional medicine. Right. And that, and that gets into, you know, the complexity of this stuff is that each individual case is different. Right. And even, you know, even with this sort of, in a way, the most basic question with chronic Lyme disease is how much of it is, how much of the problem is that there's bacteria that are still in your body that are messing with you versus how much of it is this kind of residual bodily response to a pathogen that you know isn't there or isn't really there anymore but your body is you know it's sort of this is what right autoimmune problems are your body is sort of over triggered and has to be calmed down right and the answer is probably that for some people it's the first one in which case you really just need massive antibiotic (laughs) doses to kill it and i think that was mostly true for me nothing nothing i tried that was sort of mind first sort of physical treatment second seemed to work or at least didn't do anything until I had made progress on the physical side uh, on the you know sort of just killing stuff side but then there are obviously people and I've had conversations like this who have chronic illnesses where you know they don't get better until they do some kind of brain retraining right yeah. where there it's very clearly like you're you know you're neurology is stuck in these patterns that cause inflammation and you have to retrain it. And it's not about killing bacteria. So, but again, that, that in turn makes it easy for the skeptics to, to, you know, to say, well, if, you know, you're saying every case is different, but all this means is that 
you know, this is all a manifestation of your weird individuality. Um, yeah, and herein lies, you know, why, why I think a lot of conventional medicine doctors do give up because they, first of all, they're not trained in alternative, you know, treatments to a, to the degree that somebody who specializes in is, you know, like an integrative medicine doctor, but also each body is individual and what works for some doesn't work for others. What, what works for you at the end of your journey might not have worked for you in the beginning of your journey. So it's, it's just, it, it takes a very special doctor to really look at you as an individual and go down that road with you. So, um, why do you think Lyme disease sufferers are often considered hypochondriacs and hysterical? I mean, <clears throat> we, we deal with this stigma for a lot, a lot um, of our journeys. And it's something that I feel like should be outdated by, at this point. <laughs> but what's the thought be behind that with some of these conventional medicine doctors? Well, first, Lyme creates such a weird array of shifting symptoms, right? And conventional medicine medicine is set up based around specialization, right? If you're, you know, if you have heart pain, you see a cardiologist. If you have stomach pain, you know, you, you see a gastroenterologist, um, as I know, because I saw all of these yes, doctors yours went over, to your, right. to, to, into cardiac for your, for you. Yes. I, I had chest pain. So I went and, you know, stress tested my heart and the cardiologist looks, that's, that's what the cardiologist looks like. You see, you have, you know, weird peripheral neuropathies. So you see a neurologist, um, and all of those doctors are trained to assume, which, you know, is often reasonable that, um, you know, when people have something wrong with them, what's wrong with them is this sort of concentrated thing. Something's wrong with your heart. Something's wrong with your brain. Something's wrong with your, with your gut. And so if you present as a patient and say, well, doctor, yesterday <laughs> my ears burned <laughs> and today my feet are tingling and tomorrow I'm going to, you know, vomit. Um, it doesn't fit naturally into the paradigms of what they're trained to treat. And it, you know, um, there's this term that, uh, that, uh, Megan O'Rourke, who is another writer who has a book about chronic illness and her own Lyme disease journey that's out, out this year, uh, called the invisible kingdom. She says Lyme, she says doctors have this term called heart sink patients, meaning patients where as soon as the patient starts describing the symptoms, the doctor's heart sinks because mm -hmm. they're sure that they aren't gonna be able to help them because what the patients are describing is just sort of an implausible mess that doesn't fit into medical categories. And so it's very natural to leap from that to the assumption that, you know, it's psychosomatic, it's in their head, it's primarily primarily psychiatric, right? Um, so that's that's part of it, right, the nature the nature of the symptomology is such that when you try and describe your symptoms, you sound, you know, weird. Um, and then there's also, and you sort of gestured at this earlier, the extent to which, you know, having having something like this going on in your body does make you a little crazy, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, you if there's the question of like, you know, sort of a chicken and egg problem, right? What, what comes first, the physical symptoms or the mental anguish and anxiety? Um, but it's totally possible if you spend six months or five years trapped in a cycle of constantly shifting symptoms and you can't find medical help for it. And more than that, you, you know, feel like the medical system or establishment is, you know, sort of actively hostile, then you are more likely yourself to become rageful, paranoid, uh, depressed, obviously, you know, suicidal in some cases. So all, all of, and, but then those sort of psychiatric problems, which again, I think are often downstream of physical problems, the, then they manifest themselves and they become another reason to dismiss your physical problems to say, oh, you know, you're depressed, paranoid and suicidal, obviously that's what's causing your, your physical symptoms. Um, so that's, th those are, I think, two 
uh, you know, not they're not the whole of the story, but they're right. two reasons why this sort of assumption persists. And you're very, you know, as a patient, you become very conscious of this, right? You, I talk about this a bit in the book, but you're trying to s present yourself as reasonable. You're like, well, doctor, I look, I know this sounds crazy, but I'm just going to tell you, or, you know, I'm not going to, I mean, this, this often happens, I think with, with, especially people with chronic illnesses where they don't know what it is. They go see a doctor and they don't tell the doctor everything that's wrong with them because they know right. that being that honest will sort of expose them to, to skepticism. So they sort of focus on one area here and there. And so no doctor ever gets a complete picture of what's going on. I, you're making me have flashbacks to I'm sorry. several I'm sorry. doctors that, you know, I would go in and I'd start the entire meeting with, you know, I, at, at one point I went to, to a rheumatologist and I thought I was having kidney failure. I mean, my, my, I was in so much pain and I would start there with doctor. I can't even, you know, and I would just be on the verge of tears on, you know, and this happened so many times just trying to, I bet every, you're right. Every time I went to see a specialist, it was something else. You talk about a lot in your book about your throat swelling. I had a lot of that. Um, and then recently, like a couple of years ago, I just learned to start off, you know, the conversation with, well, you know, here's my symptom and, you know, and they, they'd kind of go through talking it through or whatever. And then I'd throw in the, well, you know, and then I do have Lyme disease because, you know, my blood work came back positive and everything. And I got the opposite re response actually by just leading with that because then they would say, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, there is some truth to this, you know, right. <laughs> it's like, oh, you know, I mean, just, just the way that we have to circumvent our delivery of how we're going to tell each specialist what's going on with us and how we have to craft it to not sound crazy and hysterical is, is part of, it's an art form, I swear. And it's really kind of just a bummer uh, that we have to go through all that. Um, you talk a lot about chronic Lyme disease. And what I loved about reading in your book was, you know, the, the basically the notion of, you know, if somebody has cancer or another condition, they receive the applicable treatments and go through their process and protocol. And if they still have symptoms or any disease for that matter, or illness and, or virus, and they still have these symptoms after medical treatments, it's easily considered chronic. But yet for Lyme disease, there's this kind of barrier that we keep hitting that people, doctors just say it can't be chronic. Once you have Lyme disease, it just triggers other diseases that we then have to treat. What's your, what's your take on all of that? I mean, I, I think it's a peculiar thing, right? That the, you know, you, you have, yeah, you, you have this situation where most of the people who have chronic Lyme symptoms are people who test positive for Lyme, have Lyme disease, <laughs> clearly have Lyme disease, treat it for, you know, whatever the prescribed time is, four to six weeks, and either just continue having the same symptoms or get the same symptoms back, right? And now that's not every case. You know, there are obviously people who don't test positive and, you know, spend a long time trying to get a positive test. Um, and, you know, there's lots of, there are people who, there are lots of ambiguous cases, but there are plenty of these clear cut cases. And yeah, it's just the, the simplest explanation seem, seems like it should just be, if you have a disease and you treat it and you don't get better, you almost certainly still have the same disease. Um, and I think, you know, Part of what's going on, right, is that the the core treatment for Lyme that, you know, two weeks, four weeks, whatever, you know, whatever span of time it is, it is successful enough mm -hmm. that it's it becomes sort of a default for doctors to say, I see this succeed all the time. So if it didn't seem to succeed in this case, something else must be going on, right? And frankly, especially in a place part like the Northeast, where you have everyone, you know, everyone is encountering ticks, everyone ex is exposed to these things. You have lots and lots of doctors who have had Lyme disease themselves, who have done the basic protocol and gotten better. 
multiple times. You know, the doctor, doctor I saw initially in Connecticut, who was very helpful, who was who he was, as you say, well, he was willing to give me antibiotics without a definitive diagnosis. He was open to the idea of, you know, sort of Lyme taking longer than four weeks to resolve. But he had, you know, he had gotten it several times. And in mm. each case, it was like, you know, a few weeks of doxycycline and he was fine. <laughs> and that just, that just conditions you, I think, to be like, okay. well, this was fine for me. It's fine for almost everyone. So the outliers must be real outliers. Um, whereas the doctors, time and again, the doctors who you would see who really were willing to take chronic Lyme seriously were people who had had some kind of direct personal experience with it, whether it was themselves or in many cases, you know, a family member, one of the, you know, most significant Lyme researchers on, on the East Coast, you know, his wife had Lyme disease over many years, the doctor that I saw and had his father have, you know, cardiac problems from Lyme that took a long time to get diagnosed. So there really is this sort of way that that kind of personal experience is more persuasive by far than what seems to me like just sort of the common sense of this is persisting, you should, you should keep, you should keep trying to treat it. But I, I do think it's that, you know, let's say it's 85-15, right? 85% of cases, the protocol works, 15%, it doesn't. That's that 85% is a lot. If it was 50-50, I think you'd have a lot more belief in it. Right. Mm -hmm. But at 85, 15, doctors see enough people who get better just like a snap of their fingers that, um, yeah, they sort of leap to this. Oh, it's, you know, it, it's either it's in your head, it's an autoimmune condition, or there's something else weird or, you know, something else going on. Well, what do you, what do you think in your opinion would be the missing link or the tipping point to get us to the point where, you know, this is, sort of a widely acceptable diagnosis and, and get on it, you know, sort of just more, a more treatable condition. Is there, is there something that we need to be doing or something that you, you can tell would be that leaping point for us? I mean, I think there's sort of a slow motion effect that, you know, was happening already. That's probably been accelerated by long COVID and some of its effects, right? Where there's sort of slowly but surely more awareness of how viruses and bacteria illnesses linger in the body, even in seemingly healthy people and come back to life or, you know, or just sort of persist, right? And that's, you know, just, just a couple months ago, there was a big study on MS that pretty definitively linked MS to Epstein-Barr, the Epstein-Barr virus, right? MS at the beginning, you know, in the early days of MS, it was like chronic Lyme disease. Doctors, doctors didn't believe it was real. It was just in that case, you had, um, you know, people seeing brain lesions was what it, what it took to sort mm. of get real, real acceptance of MS, right? So now, okay, MS probably caused by some kind of chronic infection, right? Long COVID probably caused by chronic infection, you know, um, chronic fatigue syndrome, there's, a, I mean, there's clear overlap between that and long COVID. And there's a lot of research suggesting that chronic infection is there too. And I think slowly, this is like a generational process as more doctors and researchers sort of come up in a world where you're accustomed to that idea, then the idea of chronic Lyme, I think becomes less weird and more intuitive. Right now, you just have a lot of people where it's like, you get sick, you take an antibiotic, it goes away. That's the story, right? But we know more and more about sort of, you know, what hides and lingers in your body that shows that that's not true. Uh, and I think over time, that knowledge changes people, will change people's approach. But that's a gradual thing. I think for, for rapid progress, I think the big challenge here, right, is that doctors who study and treat chronic Lyme have a really good narrative really strong and persuasive narrative about the evidence that the bacteria persist. We have all these animal studies, you know, there's lots of research and anecdote data where you can say, look, here's the evidence that Lyme persists in the body. Um, what we don't have is a simple, easy to test treatment. We have, as you know, <laughs> we have treatments that 
you know, some of them work for people quickly. Um, there are people who have chronic Lyme, finally get it diagnosed, go on doxycycline, take it for like an extra month and are better. But then there's just tons and tons of people where it's like it's six months, no, it's two years, no, it's three years, or you get 80% better, you get 90% better. These are big achievements, but they the process to get there is super individualized, super complicated. Doctors, you know, even the most rigorous doctors are switching from combination to combination. Um, and, you know, the way the medical system is set up, they're looking for the the treatment that you can test in a, you know, double blind placebo controlled trial. Um, and, you know, we don't, we don't have that treatment. We don't have, it, or we, you can't run a double blind placebo controlled trial on the kind of stuff that my, you know, the best doctor I saw does where it's like, oh, you're pulsing antibiotics for, you know, on and off for 10 months. Nobody's funding that kind of like a 10 month trial with enough patients to test pulsing there. N nobody's, nobody's doing that. So I think that's a big, that's, I mean, it's just reality, but it's a big impediment to sort of getting to consensus about this because you have a lot of people who say, okay, I can accept maybe that Lyme disease persists, but I've looked at the, you know, I've seen the studies that say an extra couple of weeks of IV antibiotics doesn't do anything. So why would I embark on a two-year treatment <laughs> treatment course, right? Yeah. Um, it's it's hard it's hard to get people to sign up for the level of uncertainty and ambiguity involved in the way Lyme literate doctors do treatment. So for like the quick breakthrough, you need you know you kind of need the wonder drug. I'd like to see a study, and I'm sure there are more and more studies, but you know you talk about. <clears throat> the amount of people who um, have autopsies done after they pass away from Alzheimer's or dementia, um, different mental illness and have, and have the bacteria present in their body and brains. And perhaps that's the ultimate long hauler, you know, Lyme disease chronic person out there. And it's, it's just, it's just, I think we have to consider that because, you know, you have Lyme disease that came into the forefront in the seventies, and then you have an onslaught of new um, disorders that came out, you know, that are constantly coming out, but probably more prevalent in the nineties. And now you've got those people that are now elderly and, you know, how far does, does a chronic Lyme infection take you? Have you ever heard of any of those studies being done? I I mean, there there was a study, I'm gonna forget the date, but there there, there have been a couple studies with, with Alzheimer's um, that have, yeah, that have done what you suggest and have sort of looked for um, different things. I mean, it's not, it's not necessarily Borrelia, um, there are people who think there's a link between Alzheimer's and various parasitic infections. There's, in, again, the doctor I see is very interested in the interaction between like lots of people have parasitic infections that are latent, right? Like toxoplasmosis, which is the, the cat poop parasite, like 40% of Americans have that sort of latent in their system. That's why HIV patients need toxoplasmosis suppressing drugs because HIV attacks their immune system and then toxoplasmosis is what is what comes out. Um, so there's a lot, I think it's it's not just with Lyme, right? There's a lot of ways in which th this sort of mixture of different chronic infections probably a probably has some kind of connection to um late in life, late in life issues like Alzheimer's, which, you know, frankly, just based on my own physical experience makes sense. Like I in my own mind, when I'm, you know, I, I, I want to get, I want to get better enough. <laughs> I know I'm 42, right. You know, when I'm 70, I don't really expect that my body will be, you know, as good as it is now. Right. And sort of suppressing <laughs> things. So you want to get as, as well as you can in midlife, if you have these chronic infections, because you assume that they'll, they'll get stronger again. In a, and, in a and I can relate, you know, at, at sort of different periods of the worst of the worst of my journey, I did have, you know, now I know it as dysentomia, but 
it, it really affected me the way I would be at the grocery store, not knowing why I was at the grocery store. I really felt like I was having periods of dementia or something. And so you can understand how maybe, you know, maybe all of this could be somehow related. Okay. Fun question for you. I'd like to know what is your, if you could name one or two of your favorite treatments that you do now, just sort of preventatively, what do you do? Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, one, you know, one thing that it's not a treatment per se, it's sort of a banal thing. Um, but I, I do think once you have the capacity to exercise, um, mm. I, I've never been a big <laughs> exerciser, um, but I think it is actually really, really important to sort of, you know, again, people like there are people with chronic illnesses who exercise too much. You, you see this with long COVID, actually, people who like, you know, they're, they're told to exercise their lungs and it actually makes things worse. So you, you want to be careful with exercise, sure. but some level of, of exercise isn't, I think it's, it's not just that it's sort of good for general health and well-being and releasing endorphins and keeping you, you know, keeping you in, in good shape. It, to the extent that chronic infection is like stuff hiding in your tissue, moving your tissue, having sort of mobility and um, sort of stimulation. I think, you know, if, if you think, yeah, you're, you're, de you're, you're bringing things. I mean, a lot, a lot of what I did was not just antibiotics, but things that are theorized to bring stuff to the surface. And I still, you know, I'm in pretty good shape, but I will still have that happen where if I do kind of exercise that I haven't done, like some muscle group, you know, you go swimming when you haven't gone swimming for a long time, I will get sort of a little flare, like in my shoulder muscles, like things, things surface. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, that's good for general health, but it's also sort of a way of saying like, yeah, you're, you're scraping, <laughs> you're scraping away layers and moving, moving your body and exercising is, is one, is one way um, to do it. So that's, that's one thing, you know, I still, I, I think people, um, you know, I, I've, you sort of in an experimental spirit, right? Like when my doctor got interested in parasitic infections, I tried some herbs that are supposed to be good for what I mentioned before, toxoplasmosis. I didn't, didn't really write about this in the book because I don't, you know, I don't have any, I don't have proof that I have toxoplasmosis, but you know, my wife wrote a book about the house cat. I've been <laughs> in contact with a lot of cats and uh -huh. I, I, you know, those, I suspect that those kind of things might've helped me. I think looking, you know, for everyone, it might be something different. Maybe it's Epstein-Barr, maybe, you know, but there are a lot of things that interact with Lyme. And so once you've sort of achieved a certain level of progress, directly treating Lyme and tick-borne illness, sort of poking a little bit with other, mm -hmm. with other possibilities. Like why, you know, why do you get to 80% and not a hundred percent? Well, maybe there's something in there that gets you another 10%. Um, sure. So I think things, things, things like that, you know, again, that once you reach a certain level and aren't in the grind of like, here are my 30 pills, <laughs> I'm taking every day <sighs> yeah. and sort of, I, yeah, no, you know, you know that, right. But, mm -hmm. but if you're not, if, if you get a little bit past that, you can say, all right, I'm doing pretty well. I'm just going to try this one supplement and see what happens. So I, I think, think I think, I think it's important to do that. Yeah. Continuing to experiment. And even I probably don't do this enough, right. Cause the, the other tendency is when you're feeling okay, you're like, I just want to forget, yeah. <laughs> just want to forget that you were ever, ever sick. But if there's still stuff hiding in your system, it's sort of worth, it's worth poking at it, at least when you're our age, maybe not when I'm, you know, 78, God willing. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I'm, I'm to the stage where you are now. I'm, I might, you know, I sort of feel like I lived with an ongoing flu for years and years, and now I'm just don't have that, but I have to stay, there's no doubt that I have to stay on top of my immune system. You know, I <clears throat> work on it every day and I continue to do that as, as a, just a preventative nature. And I do agree with you. Detoxing is probably the, you know, sweating is yep. probably the one thing that we can do for free anytime 
you know, to any degree, even if you're bedridden, you can do it from your bed if you want to, but you, you, you can stretch, get mobile and do something to sweat it out a little bit. Um, you can, but, you can, you can even, you know, in the spirit of the rice machine, you can even go on YouTube and listen to detox frequencies while ly lying in bed. These are things, yeah. this is the kind of thing that I, I recommend to people as like a gateway drug to the weirder stuff. I'm like, just, just <laughs> listen to this YouTube video, ignore the ads about alien civilizations that precede the YouTube video. Just, you know, so. I'm sure there's an app for that, an app for everything yeah. these days. And you could probably play it while you're in your car. And it is a passive treatment that um, studies are very, you know, very promising and, and, positive and have been for, for sound frequencies from for a long long time you know and you talk about that in your book as well so are there any last words you want to impart on our listeners today i mean just you know the basic thing that i try and say to anyone i talk to who's sicker than i am right now which is that uh, you know we're talking about sort of the importance of experimentation but the you know the bottom line with so much of this stuff is the importance of persistence and just the belief that it is worth it to keep trying you know i i did not spend weeks or months trying to get better i spent years and years and years and if you had told me at the start that how long it would take to get to 90 or 95 percent it would have been unimaginable to me um, that I could persist yeah. that long, but now that I am 90 or 95%, it is completely worth it. And there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of people who need to believe that it's worth it in order to keep going. So it is, it is worth it. You probably can get better and you should keep trying. I agree with that mind over matter. Sometimes fake it till you make it, just keep going, put one step foot in front of the other, even though it feels like two steps back. Sometimes it, you will hit a point where you start then the better days outnumber the worst days. Thank you for your time today. Um, your book, again, The Deep Places um, can be found at thetickchicks.com. A reminder, if you purchase it through our website, um, any proceeds there go toward Lyme disease awareness. Um, I cannot tell my listeners enough how touching your book was to me. And I think anybody, especially those newly diagnosed with Lyme disease, if you read the first chapter, you're hooked because I, I promise you every person can relate to this journey and how it starts off and how um, eloquently and beautifully you describe it. And uh, it's just a real honest, honest journey of Lyme disease and going through it, you feel like you're going through it with you. And, um, and truly, if anybody out there is curious about certain treatments, and maybe their side effects or whatever, going to diff different doctors and learning their opinions about everything, I think it's, a, it's just a great overview of what a typical person with Lyme disease goes through. So we thank you for that. Um, your work is not in vain. We will definitely be reading more and more. We hope to continue reading about this in the New York Times. And, um, and I just encourage everyone to go out and, and buy the book. So thank you again. We are so grateful for your time and uh, we hope to talk to you soon. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the kind words and for, and for having me on.